Yeah, so I'm Annie I'm from UCL and I'm the co-founder of the Pharmacoepi Data Collaborative. Um, and I've also got Alejandro and so uh, Sophie here today. If you guys maybe can give a wave to everybody. <laughs> and they'll be helping me uh, with the facilitation. Um, so I've just got a couple of slides I'm going to start the session with. Um, bear with me, I'm just trying to share them. Okay, can everybody see the slides? Yep, great. So, um, yeah, as we said, this session is all about code sharing and review in the life sciences. And um, the aim is really to think about introducing best practice and overcoming barriers. So I'm just going to really quickly give you a bit of um, an introduction to the Pharmacopy Data Collaborative. And we'll talk about code sharing in the context of this, just to make it seem a little bit more real. Um, but really, you know, we want anything that's applicable um, to life sciences generally. Um, and I'll introduce some of the benefits and barriers to code sharing and review. Then we'll have the main focus of the session, which will be a discussion. And um, I think we're probably going to go into breakout rooms for that um, around key requirements, the best practice and solutions to the barriers. Then we'll all come back to the main room to share what was discussed in the, the breakout rooms. Um, and facilitators will help you making notes on this because the idea is that the outputs of this session um, will be guidelines that we can implement on our uh, pharmacopy online knowledge hub um, but these will also be publicly available for anyone in life sciences or, or other uh, domains to use so i'll just um, start by introducing the example of pharmacoepidemiology um, and basically this is just the use of health record data to understand medication safety and effectiveness in the real world. So a uh, post-clinical trial in real people um, doing real things. <laughs> um, and so I'm a psychiatric pharmacoepidemiologist. We've also got Sophie here, who's a diabetologist, but she's also a pharmacoepidemiologist. Uh, Cindy, my other co-founder is a GP, but also a pharmacoepidemiologist. Matthew's a pharmacist and so on. You know, we've got anyone you can think of who works in something related to health can also be a pharmacoepidemiologist. So what I'm saying is it's a really, um, sorry, the slides keep on skipping before I do. <laughs> it's a very multidisciplinary domain. Um, and we were each working on our, our different research projects, um, but doing things slightly differently. Um, and yeah, so is this reliable, reproducible, reusable? Um, the answer usually is no. <laughs> um, so we're all working on the same thing in slightly different ways. Uh, we use code lists. So it's basically a, a list of different variables that can be used to identify a particular disease or drug or outcome. Um, and at the beginning of a project, each person often starts with producing a new code list. Um, again, you know, based on often just their own experience, the words that they can think of at the time. And people all using different code lists used to lead to different results. Um, again, at the beginning of a project, we have to do you know, weeks, often months of extensive data management. Um, and this could take you know, months of just trial and error, uh, duplicating things that other people have already done. And again, different approaches in this, doing something, a slightly different bit of code somewhere can lead to different results in the research. Um, and finally, uh, we use quite a lot of advanced statistical programming. Again, um, we can't always see how people have got to their results. Um, and, you know, the, a tiny difference in the coding can lead to completely different findings. And there are really a lack of examples within our domain. So we have to, um, you know, use things in different scientific areas and sort of change them slightly. We might be changing them in different ways, um, but no one really knows what anyone's doing often. <laughs> So this is why, well, one of the reasons why we founded the Pharmacopy Data Collaborative. And I'm sure this sounds probably familiar to a lot of you working in um, the coding world, the kind of problems that we're facing. The idea of the collaborative um, is an international network of multidisciplinary researchers, and we're aiming to promote open science, share learning, and facilitate collaborations. And one of the ways we want to do this is by setting up an online knowledge hub. And it's, um, so we're building it on GitHub, 
and it's going to be an open science platform for pharmacoepidemiology. It's going to be a place where we can share learning, uh, knowledge, resources, code. So that's really what we're talking about today, the code sharing platform part of it. Um, we're hoping that it's going to be community led, but we also want it to be curated for quality um, with opportunities for constructive and friendly, very importantly, feedback um, and opportunities for collaborations as well. So that's a, a bit of the context of where we're coming from um, with this code sharing platform that we're start trying to set up. Um, so some of the benefits uh, of sharing code, which I'm sure if you're in this workshop, you're probably aware of. Um, so it reduces duplication of all of these often data processing tasks that um, could, can be thankless and take lots of trial and error um, and are often reinventing the wheel. So it can reduce that duplication. And it also raises awareness of, um, you know, often months of work that people don't realise you've done. They might just think you you jump onto the bit of coding for results, <laughs> uh, which is not how it works. Um, and probably the biggest one uh, is around the transparency of results. So you can publish uh, an open source well, um, yeah, paper that anyone can have access to, but you won't be able to see the, the coding that's led to the findings. Um, so you can never really see exactly how people have got to where they've got to. And I think that, yeah, so something like 44% of medical research is reproducible when people try and follow the steps to see, um, to get to the same results. So the majority of medical research um, you could say it's not transparent and not re reproducible. And this then stops the con continuity of research. So if you want to you know, follow up and, and move to um, more adv advanced findings, you often need to start again because you can't reproduce the, the evidence base that already exists. So the benefits of sharing code are all of these things. Um, finally, also around learning. Um, in life sciences, we're often not formally trained in coding. So we just have to figure stuff out a lot of the time. But in sharing code, we can help them develop future researchers as well. So that's all the benefits. Um, but then why are life sciences quite far behind compared to other research areas in terms of the transparency of research? Um, now, a lot of these barriers, I think, are, are the same, whatever scientific area you're in, um, apart from possibly the last one. Um, but some of the things that uh, life science researchers have identified are the fear that the code contains mistakes. So you might publish something and then someone finds a mistake in your code later, um, that your coding is messy or inefficient. And this is often because we have had this informal training that leads to a lack of confidence. Um, and also if people have perhaps published something previously and received quite nasty feedback. Um, this isn't a rare thing to re receive mean feedback on your code. Um, so if people are, are scared of that. Um, and it can be time consuming to, to tidy up your code into a state that you think is no longer messy to, to comment on everything so that people understand exactly why you're doing what you've been doing. Um, often working with um, in human research, you have to de-identify identifiable information and then actually uploading it itself can be time consuming. Um, and then a, another big thing is a, a fear of the code being reused without receiving credit for you know, potentially months of work that you've done. Um, and finally, the final point is maybe, I don't know if this is particular just to human research, but um, you know, we have a bit of a culture of being terrified of sharing anything data related because you see all, all the media um, saying, you know, patient data escape to that kind of thing. Um, so it's created a, a bit of a, a fear culture. So this brings me to the, the discussion, which um, I really want to focus on in the session today. Whoops, sorry. Um, so... These, the outputs of the session I said, we're going to hopefully um, form guidelines for the, the Pharmacopia Online Knowledge Hub's uh, code sharing platform. And the key questions I want to ask um, that can uh, contribute to these guidelines are, what are the key features of best practice in code sharing and review? Um, how can these provide solutions to the identified barriers? And are there any other barriers that we've not identified that we maybe need to address? Um, so yeah, just to recap before we go into the, some breakout rooms. Um, so 
what are the, the key features of best practice in co-sharing and review? How can these provide solutions to the identified barriers? And are there any other barriers that we've not identified? So we're just going to go into some smaller rooms now for um, about 10 minutes. So we'll come back at uh, quarter past three and then we'll, um, so the facilitators will float around the room to see if you need any help. And then we'll come back into the main session um, and discuss everything as a larger group. So um, I think Sophie, if you could open the, the breakout rooms, that would be great. And I'll see you guys back in 10 minutes. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, we'll just give it the final few seconds for everyone to come back in the room. Uh, they're seeing lots of notes coming up from your room, I think, in uh, the Google Doc, which is excellent. It looks like a good discussion so far. So it's the longest 60 seconds in the world, isn't it, when you're waiting for the breakout rooms to close? <laughs> it's, yeah, especially when you've got a few people who've come in already. <laughs> okay, I think that's everyone back now. Um, so welcome back, everybody. I hope... Um, has yeah, some good discussions. It seems very short and sweet, doesn't it? And uh, just this 30 minute session. Um, so we've got some notes in the, the Google Doc already, which is fantastic. But I wondered if um, each room could maybe share some of their, their key points um, with us. So I don't know, I'll maybe, should we start with, was anyone keen to go first? Otherwise, maybe should we start with room four? Going backwards for a bit of variety. Dave, would you like to say something? You, Sorry, you I, off, um, I didn't know. Flow when we um, <laughs> came out of the break off room. So I uh, wasn't sure which room I was in. I couldn't remember. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we talked about some of the challenges. Um, 10 minutes did go really quickly. I think we talked about making sure that code uh, in terms of, uh, like it needs to be findable, um, sharing it, making it available um, and being willing to do that culturally within the research group is one thing, but um, people have to be able to find it and having um, a, a kind of regular uh, lab GitHub space that you can share code um, means that people will be able to come back and. Uh, have the kind of standards th that they might expect in terms of finding code. Um, and then we also talked about um, annotation uh, or like commenting code uh, as well. And uh, so my, com my comments were uh, that uh, I'm an RSE and I work on a particular part of the pipeline, but there's PhD students uh, that will come and write code. Uh, within that pipeline and uh, it's not that they're not interested in best practice but they are primarily focused on getting their PhD and kind of doing the science that needs to be done and that's a huge barrier to kind of trying to implement best practice in the code to, to kind of make this uh, kind of findable and easily understandable and reproducible so um, very much focusing on cultural change at that level um, across the entire group, not just within RSEs, but also obviously within RSE groups as well. Um, so I think that's quite an important thing as well. That's all really helpful. Thank you. I guess, yeah, as you say, it is one thing sharing it, but another thing making it findable. Otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> um, and yeah, everything you said is exactly right around, you know, being time consuming and you just want to get the science done. It's another thing to do something that perhaps you're not thanked for and I don't want to make that sound very critical of PhD students mm. they're obviously under <laughs> immense pressure in, in other ways to to um to do work and stuff it's not that they're not interested it's just that it's it feels like it's low down the priority list yeah absolutely there's always a lot to do for for everyone I think <laughs> um 
uh, one of the other rooms perhaps like to share what they were talking about uh, yeah james yeah so we um we focused mainly on question one and two but we spent a lot of time on question one um and, and much the same as what Dave's just been saying, um, like the, the ability to code share, the environments that you're running in, the ease of use and accessibility of code all help like a mutual understanding of uh, these uh, things and the goals and standards that you adhere to really helps with the code review process. And that's how code review can actually help um, help people to arrive at that mutual understanding. So say for example if you do have a team uh, of, of varying skill levels then the code review process is ultimately quite good for promoting or you know disseminating those standards and those goals amongst the team um, other things to be really clear about were um, the sort of expected usages of any of any library or any um, code that you might have uh, the testing required in order to ensure that it still works even when you go through various iterations um, and another best practice was uh, the use of uh, templates so that people know how to report things in a consistent manner. Um, and then we went on to question two about how this can help. And it's mainly around it promotes openness and clarity um, for everyone involved. Um, and there's also a form of education and knowledge sharing amongst the team. Thanks. That's all so helpful. Um, yeah, I think this has been a when we put all of these together into a document, I think it would be really useful for, for everyone beyond our, our PharmaCoFE project as well. Um, perhaps someone from another room, like to, I've only got a few minutes left, so just quickly the last couple of rooms share um, some key findings with everyone. It's key findings, <laughs> some key discussion points. I can do one. Um, so we picked up on um, a point that uh, you made, Annie, in, in your presentation that um, uh, a lot of researchers are really averse to the idea of sharing their code for, for various reasons, often kind of they're, they're scared or embarrassed. Um, and this is just a point that I see over and over again in, in every, every discipline. Um, and I guess it's worth stressing and reminding people that uh, the, the benefits of sharing their code with, with people really outweigh the perceived risks um, and the, this is just a really uh, important point, point to make that there's far more to be gained from uh, from sharing codes. Yeah, absolutely. I've just got to emphasise those gains probably a bit more. Um, and the, the final room, someone like to, got three minutes left. <laughs> Hello. Sure, Sam go ahead. I think. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what we've what we were discussing has kind of already been covered. Um, I was just going to highlight that we talked a little bit about um, people during their undergrads aren't rigorously taught coding in any meaningful sense, and um, they're certainly not like even myself as a like a physics undergrad. We did like one coding module, and that was it. Um, and I think there's very much a need to to introduce coding sustainability including things like code sharing at an earlier age because that's just you know not being taught um so that, that was the one thing that stood out that i hadn't heard there's something else but i can't remember what it was <laughs> I mean, yeah sure you know i've made it through phd from undergrad to phd with no coding modules or or teaching at all <laughs> so um the exact example of what you said. Um, okay, this has been so helpful. Um, if you do have anything else that you can think of that you'd like to contribute, um, please you can uh, continue to add to the Google Doc, um, which I believe you will have, but perhaps we could post it in the chat in case you don't. Ah, yes, you've already had it posted in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, are we handing over to another session or is this 